In this class, we're going to be covering a lot of really large and important problems. Uh, how do how does the environment ha uh, shape human security, and how does uh, environmental phenomena directly or indirectly shape uh, the likelihood that we actually see conflict either between people, between groups, or between states. And in touching on these large issues, I wanted to kind of ground it by a couple of memorable photos that we're going to be coming back to in future weeks of the class, but that typify for me the large challenges that we face as people who study politics and trying to understand how the environment shapes uh, political challenges, as well as a couple of important examples that shaped the history that got us here today. And so when I think about uh, how the environment shapes society and survival. The first example that comes to me is the example of uh, Mayan, the Mayan civilization in Guatemala. Here is an aerial photograph of Tikal, one of their uh, former cities. Absolutely beautiful if you're able, uh, ever able to get to northern Guatemala. Um, it, it is the focus of Jared Diamond's books, one of his books on human collapse and one of the great mysteries of why a technologically advanced society who had survived for centuries had a complex culture, written uh, language, and uh, uh, religious practices basically uh, just disappeared sometime in the 8th or 9th century uh, AD. Um, it is related to a couple of challenges uh, connected to de uh, deforesta uh, deforestation, over extraction of environmental resources, things that we're gonna be talking, talking about in um, the environmental challenges in week four, as well as the natural disasters. Uh, uh, week 10 and drought related to water in week seven. Um, also, when I was visiting there in the 90s, there was an ongoing uh, civil conflict in Guatemala. It wasn't safe to go by land there, so I had to fly uh, from, uh, uh, from the capital city. Um, and so Guatemala is one of those countries that did have the sorts of conflicts that we're going to be talking about later on in the term and has been struggling to reconcile and to hold to account uh, the the actions and the people who perpetrated the actions during uh, the conflict. Next, next example would be the Iraq War of 1991. Uh, happened before, long before most of my students were alive. Uh, a lot of the students now don't even remember the uh, Iraq War of 2003, but this uh, picture comes from the U.S. and United Nations troops coming to try to uh, liberate Kuwait from uh, Iraq because Saddam Hussein had uh, invaded uh, Kuwait in 1990, resisted all attempts by international actors to try to negotiate a settlement. And so the UN, and uh, led by the United States, went in and um, forced the Iraqi troops to retreat from Kuwait, though they didn't go all the way to Baghdad to be able to remove Saddam Hussein. As the Iraqi troops were withdrawing, they basically tried to destroy a lot of the infrastructure for um, generating petroleum uh, wealth and started fires both of tankers as well as of um, oil wells as well that took months to be able to, to put out. So there was large environmental damage conducted for a political reason to slow the opponent's ability to progress into the country and create challenges that they would have to uh, to solve. But it also shows the connection between um, natural resource production and how much we rely on uh, oil and how it could be a strategic factor in protecting certain people, certain groups, and, and certain countries in uh, the international realm. Third photo would be of an uh, open pit artisanal gold mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This area has had the mixed blessing of a large amount of extractable resources. The international system uh, values a lot from gold to coltan 
to lithium, a lot of the resources that we depend on now for uh, electronic vehicles and making the push from petroleum-based energy sources to renewable ones, unfortunately relies on a lot of the minerals that people can take out of the ground by hand in developing countries, which we're going to be focusing on later on in the term, that the struggle uh, for societies to meet the needs of their citizens for their resources, food, shelter, water, and transport are often crucial to shaping the developmental practices and trajectories of people on the other side of the world that we might not be familiar with at all. Another issue and challenge is uh, desertification. The Sahel in, in Africa is uh, a region across uh, most of the north uh, part of the continent that is facing some of the largest challenges related to climate change. The climate there is moving faster than almost anywhere outside of the polar regions. And we're going to be talking about the importance of water and other resources, but water specifically in Week seven, I believe that you have a redistribution of where water is being produced and um, coming down as precipitation around the world. And that is pushing peoples to migrate to where there is uh, water and uh, leading to group level conflicts between herders and uh, agriculturalists, people who grow things out of the ground, and those that, that move with uh, livestock. Um, conflicts in the Sahel is, is an issue we're going to be touching on in the class. Another way that we can deal with a lack of water is uh, something you might not have uh, come across, but this is a shot of former fishing boats in the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan. Aral Sea was... Uh, one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world until the Soviet Union made a strategic decision to start diverting some of the water that would have flown into the Aral, uh, flown, flowed into the Aral Sea to be able to grow cotton, which was strategically important during the Cold War. It is absolutely the craziest, craziest place. We're going to be touching on it in the uh, water chapter as well, in which you had these fishing boats, people who had dependent on um, fish as, as a means of, of generating uh, wealth and, and uh, sustainability in this vast inland uh, region of uh, Central Asia and how political decisions ended up completely changing the environment in this starkest of ways. We're also going to see that it had unanticipated consequences because there was a biological weapons lab on an island in the middle of the Aral Sea and that once the water was drained, those some of the toxins were able to actually leave the island in a way that they hadn't been when they'd been surrounded by water. Of course, there's also a possibility of having too much water, and we're going to be talking in the Natural Disasters Week about how this redistrib redistribution of water from certain parts of the world to other parts, it can lead to challenges with lack of water in the Sahel and other areas, but it can also cause predictable problems and exacerbated problems in other countries like Bangladesh, in which you had here um, street flooding in the capital city of the country. And we're going to be talking about how different people have struggled to try to mitigate or adapt to these challenges, the floods that are coming with increasing regularity and the, the structural challenges of countries to be able to respond to these kind of slow moving natural disasters. We're also going to be touching on fast moving excesses of water in um, in Banda Aceh in Indonesia. This is uh, an aerial photograph of that uh, provincial capital in Aceh in Indonesia back in 2004 after the tsunami that occurred off the um, uh, Indonesian archipelago and off of uh, off the Malay Peninsula that led to hundreds of thousands of people dying. And um, surprisingly, this natural disaster actually helped to end a conflict, that you had a huge natural disaster, and most of the literature thinks that natural disasters make conflict more likely. This is um, a counter take on that, in which you had a natural disaster that actually helped end a conflict. And then there is the case of Syria, which hasn't gotten as much attention in international media over the last couple of years, but that there's still 
ongoing tensions. The U.S. just killed the latest ISIS leader a couple of weeks ago, but you had in uh, five or six years ago huge challenges of migration from an ongoing conflict. We're also going to be doing some reading about some theorists think that the um, the unprecedented drought that occurred in Syria before the start of the conflict can actually be linked towards internal migration to urban areas, and that can lead to conflict within the state. And I think Syria is a great example of an internationalized civil conflict that we're going to be talking about, how both international causes like the Arab Spring could lead people to hit the streets, but then also the involvement of international countries like the U.S. and Russia, Turkey, and other countries in the region can make that conflict worse and more uh, intractable or potentially help reach some kind of negotiated solution, as well as the refugee flows outside the country created unprecedented challenges, not unprecedented, but great challenges to European countries in the years after. So there's a lot of these kind of ongoing short-term and long-term challenges we're going to be uh, covering in the class. One of the largest environmental impact uh, phenomena that we're going to be touching on in the class is the rising uh, temperatures around the world leading to unprecedented sea loss, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. You see here aerial... um, maps of Arctic sea, li- uh, sea loss over the last couple decades. The We're going to be touching on in later weeks how the, the opening of uh, passages in the Arctic to, to boats has led to a scramble for both resources as well as transport routes uh, across the, uh, across the, um, the Arctic across in the, in the north, as well as the potential for the sea ice loss, uh, sea ice loss, to um, to feed on each other, have this interactive effect that uh, a lot of the worst estimates that people had 10 or 15 years ago are being surpassed by the current sea ice loss that we've seen, and how that is uh, provoking a huge amount of challenges to low-lying areas like in Bangladesh, but then also in New York uh, had flooding after a a storm a couple of years ago. Australia has a lot of low-lying areas, people clustering along the coast. And so this sea ice loss that's that's happening in areas far away from civilized society is having an effect on um, people around the world. You can see these uh, exposed population for uh, for this um, for these kind of uh, um, uh, raising sea levels in from Africa to to Southeast Asia to East Asia uh, and to Vietnam. And I think these these challenges that the environmental security issues that we're going to be touching on in this class are quite large oh, and. I, I think in focusing on the politics of these phenomena in this class, it can be hard going sometimes. And a lot of the international efforts we're going to be touching on in week 12 so far have um, not met the challenges that the scientists and all evidence kind of points towards uh, the problem that we're facing from corporations uh, to the last uh, COP26 uh, meeting in the UK the ability to be able to react to a challenge is often a function of the costs and benefits of responding to the challenge we're going to be touching on in this class, uh, how many actors have to agree to be able to to combat it. And I think the way that these challenges are, are distributed around the world is not completely fat, uh, flat. Different people face these different challenges. And um, I just saw this in the the newspaper uh, a couple of weeks ago, just focusing on the unequal um, creation of the problem and creating the solution. The average American refrigerator in the U.S. uses more uh, electricity than people in the uh, for all of their uh, energy use in a number of different sub-Saharan African countries. So the the costs are unequally born, and the 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 causes behind them were also unequally generated. And so with this class, a lot of it is is motivated by my own curiosity and feeling of 
the need to better understand the relationships between the environment, us as humans, what we do in that environment, and how our conflict both shapes the environment and how the environment shapes our, our conflicts. And I, I think in a lot of ways, you can kind of feel like a modern name, uh, Cassandra, right? I come from that literature background. Uh, Cassandra was... Um, a uh, brother, a uh, sister of uh, Hector in Troy in ancient mythology, was given the curse of knowledge about what was going to happen, the fall of Troy. Uh, you can kind of you can see the um, Odysseus's horse there down in the lower left, um, but that she was cursed to have no one believe her. And so, with these kind of challenges, I think there's increasing awareness in societies around the world and frustration with governments to be able to meet these kind of challenges. But in studying these topics, it can be uh, a challenge that can seem uh, a bit like uh, uh, Cassandra or uh, Chicken Little, right? Uh, coming from, um, I think it was a British or Anglo-Saxon myth in which you had this uh, chicken calling for the calling for the skies falling, and I wanted to recognize here initially and briefly the fact that talking about these kind of challenges, I know that people who I work with that study terrorism or human rights violations or conflict, it can often seem a bit abstract sometimes. You really don't think about the implications of what it means for real people um, in the world. But then also I think a lot of us as academics struggle with the knowledge of how society is working, what we're doing uh, to the earth. There's a Mother Jones article talking about the difficulties of academics studying these larger environmental um, phenomena, but then also there's uh, ongoing challenges to just all of us living with these these challenges. I have family in California that have been faced with these wildfires over the last couple of years that are, are just able to have that perspective even in shorter lifespans to see the way that these things are changing and the push to try to to reconcile um, your individual level behavior with how people have decided to respond to it or, or not to respond it can be psychologically difficult so i want to recognize that and and highlight the fact that this has been a challenge um both for for academics for policymakers as well as for um uh, for students as well so there's increasing research on what effect this is having on people. And I think in dealing with these environmental challenges that we're gonna be touching on in this uh, semester, there's been, um, I'm, I'm from an older generation in which Al Gore was kind of the voice of these, uh, uh, the voice of trying to, uh, a clarion call for people to be able to recognize these issues and be able to address them. I think nowadays that role would kind of fall to Greta Thunberg. I think the responses to her over the last couple of years on Twitter and elsewhere is just emblematic of, of the need for people to rally around a figure that can motivate action and to provide um, leadership for that kind of action and the moral and the moral uh, strength of of belief and evidence base in trying to use shame which is not uh, a feeling that people often talk about in academic circles but it can be a motivation for for human behavior but then also there's been huge backlash related to age related to uh, gender as well as to how these issues are being uh, raised that can cause um, a backlash. I lived in Louisiana for four years and I had never heard of the term rolling coal before I had moved there when people actually modify their pickup trucks to try to create more pollution as a way to kind of trigger the libs or people who are trying to, um, to try to make policy changes that people might link policies and the, what they do as jobs to, to, um, identity and to group identity that can cause conflict as we're going to see later on in the term. So I think I've been talking for a while now, so I'd like to, to turn it over to two people, two, two external videos that highlight a, a couple of these issues. The first one um, uh, is of Greta Thunberg, and as you watch it, I think 
I would encourage you to stay to the end. She refers to a change coming, and I'd be interested for the students who are taking this class uh, at the ANU to go to Waddle and to be able to give your perspective as to what you think the changes is she's referring to at the end, as well as any other thoughts that you might have. You might have seen this video before. It's quite famous, but... Uh, to this call, um, uh, create a core, uh, as well as a call to arms um, that, that she has in that video. The second one, I think, is a n a nothing related to political science, but it connects to the experiences that I know a lot of undergraduates have uh, at the ANU that I teach of uh, third year, fourth year, and beyond students who are ready to enter the real world. He talks about how um, um, as you go on uh, out into the world, there could be certain challenges or the nature of human society that everyone kind of takes for granted that they don't talk about. Um, and uh, this is water is going to be one of those uh, one of those topics we're going to be keeping coming back to. How can we see the unconscious or the things that might seem uh, transparent in the world? How can we clearly see? Uh, those challenges and what is the importance of putting meaning on certain things and how much agency to do we have in seeing them and be able to responding them in a, in a way that is that is not as easy to see but that is through critical thinking in the class through research through understanding and by taking a step back that we have this gift of in this class over the next 12 weeks to think about the big questions to try to make visible what might not be visible to us in our day-to-day -day lives so i think for for you for the for the students in the class which of these topics that we have in the class has the most meaning or reality to you, as as um, David Foster Wallace might put, also put that one in in Waddle as well. And yeah, it's covering these kind of big theoretical questions, but then grounding it in specific case studies and specific readings that we're going to be covering um, later on today and for the rest of the semester. So let's uh, watch those uh, videos by um, Greta Thunberg and David Foster Wallace, and we'll come back and start uh, talking about how we kind of draw mental maps to understand the world.